Um, please welcome Dr. Brandon McCormick. Thank you so much. It is indeed good to be here um, back at Louisville Seminary. As uh, Dr. Craig O'Snell mentioned, I had the privilege of teaching here for a year before I transitioned over to the University of Louisville. Uh, my office was on the second floor. I had the best floor mates um, ever with, uh, with Cliff Kirkpatrick to my right and with Deborah Mumford to my left and bookended by the beautiful Elizabeth Walker and my dear friend and colleague, Shannon Craig O'Snell, who was very, very kind to me in my year here. And people do not have to be kind to you. And when they are, it is appropriate to say thank you. So I thank you so much for uh, your ongoing friendship and what that's been to me. And thank you for this invitation to be here today. I have really uh, appreciated this conference, this Race, Faith, and Community Conference. It has been powerful. It began powerfully last night. For those of you who were here last night, you know that uh, DeRay McKesson was electric, uh, and the homiletical brilliance of Dr. Callahan was certainly on display. I, too, with Dr. Jennings, was very proud to be Baptist um, <laughs> last night in that moment. And so, I, but, I, but, you know, I'm, um, you know, I, I got jittery now. I said, now I have to moderate all this brilliance that is in the room, and I was walking out earlier, Dr. Savage said to me, how are we doing? Do you think we have anything left to talk about? I said, are you kidding? I mean, you all have put so much on the table, right, that my job is relatively easy, is just to grab up some of the fragments of what you've already said, and to continue this dialogue and conversation, and then invite you to continue in the conversation, and to ask some of the questions that you've been uh, holding and waiting to ask, but also to put these brilliant panelists into conversation with one another and see the kind of synergy of brilliance that comes together as they uh, talk with one another. Uh, so let me, let me begin with a kind of a, a general question. In, in listening to uh, DeRay McKesson last night, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he was talking about the, the, the significance, talking about the significance <laughs> <laughs> of this moment, right, that we're in, that we're having this conversation about race and faith and justice and community. And one of the things that he said so beautifully, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he said, we did not invent this moment, but there is something special about this moment. And I wonder if you all could think uh, together and think with me, how would you describe the distinctiveness of this historical moment, right? And how does that affect how we talk about these intersections of the quite contested terms of race, faith, and community? Or perhaps differently put, is there something about the distinctiveness of this moment that opens up possibilities for us to conceive of these terms and the relationships between them differently? What is it that's special about this moment? <laughs> I'll, I'll take. I'll take. Okay, All right. I'll take a stab at it. Um, so, um, so the, the the wonderful thing about being first is that nobody expects you to finish. Um, but but what I would what I would say about I think what for me is and I I think I said this too last night in the sermon. I certainly was thinking it. What's so exciting to me about the moment that we're in is the capacity um, because of a shared witness to make connections across various uh, boundaries and lines. Um, so there's a way that um, lots of people are dying, lots of blood is being shed, but there's a way in which uh, Twitter, in particular, made us able. Um, I knew that Michael Brown was dead while he was still on the ground in Ferguson on Canfield. And from the moment that, it, that the story started to appear on Twitter, I knew something about this was different. Um, I think that the, and I think that's what's so extraordinary to me about the moment is that because of Twitter we're, and other 
mass communication, we are able to make connections that we might not otherwise be able to make. And those connections and the, the energy that derives from those connections are what I think is building. Um, and the human beings with whom, for me, yeah. with whom I'm connecting, are just extraordinary people that I feel like I've known forever on the one hand, but I'm also feeling really excited to meet. Um, so that's the, the start is these, these connections for me. And I'll just say a, a couple of things about uh, that since you raised the question of Twitter, which really is a, a way of raising a question about technology. And it reminds me, in an earlier work I did had nothing to do with religion, I really was talking about the coming and the creation of, of radio as, a, as the first mass medium in this country where you could create uh, sort of an audience that was invisible to itself but nonetheless could simultaneously get the same story, get the same uh, information, get the same music. And so I think we're, so there, so, so there is technology that is, is really built for the moment and then also reinforces um, you know, some of the tensions that we're seeing. So you can have a message and you can have a medium, which is Twitter, but you still have to have messengers. And I think the messengers who have been made visible to us, uh, people on the ground who are engaged in putting their own lives and bodies on the line, have been made visible to us. And there are a lot of them, and a lot more that we, than we would have known uh, any other way. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that is interesting about this moment to me is that it's a really interesting uh, uh, combination of a period of in, in extraordinary anger and enragement, if that's a word, over all of the killings and death that we've all witnessed, I mean, as eyewitnesses, uh, because of the other technologies, the visual, um, but also it's a period of tremendous hope. And I don't know how we're holding that intention or for how long, but I do feel those things wrapped up together and it's rare that that happens. Uh, I'm just, so that would be one thing I feel whenever I think about this. Yeah, I concur. I th I concur with what's been said. I, I also think one of the, uh, the one of the most unique aspects of what's new now is that for the first time we have what many people call digital natives doing the kind of thinking, intellectual work, political work that others in the past had done. And because they're digital natives, their ability to disseminate information, get information, um, clarify um, matters, find out where, the, where it's truth, and where it's deception is unique and exciting. I think what's also crucial is that because we're talking in many cases about digital natives, people who know how to work the flow of communication, um, the, the strength of the local is being joined in new and fabulous ways. So, you know, as the, the dear brother was saying, he's going to all these local communities and he is tapping into the energy, power, and hope at the local level in ways that we have not been able to do before. One thing that may not be new, but I think it's having a new effect, is that generational shift of younger people taking hold of the legacy in the ways they want to and pressing forward critique in beautiful ways. What, what, what I so much appreciated about dear brother yesterday was the, the incisiveness of his critique. You know, I, 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 when I was listening, I thought I was listening to a young Malcolm X, you know, thinking out loud, just wonderful. And you realize in some ways that's the continuation of a, of a kind of intellectual tradition, but in another way, it's, it's very different, it's very new. And that's exciting to see. The, I think the, the, there is um, a, a new moment of crisis, I think, for many of us post 50 year old people. And that is, um, and I think my dear sister mentioned this earlier, wh where, where is our hope? Where, where is our hope? Do, do we, you know, do we have to be schooled freshly in hope mm -hmm. by those who are on the ground fighting um, in places where many of us had thought, you know, there was really no hope. And, and maybe what's happening now is that the teachers of hope 
are not the ones who in the past had been the teachers of hope. I'd like to add to that that what I think is new about this moment is that people have returned to the streets. We look at some of the groups that were involved with the civil rights movement that began as grassroots responses to the injustice, like uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, and over time they became institutionalized, mm -hmm. and they lost a connection to, uh, to the street. And what's happening with Black Lives Matter is, is you see people in the streets. They, they are digital natives, but they haven't been held hostage to the technology. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not doing so-called activism behind a computer terminal. They're in, they're in the streets. And we need to be in the streets. And mm -hmm. the, you know, the Urban League, the Congress for Racial Equality, they've done great work, but they, um, they've become institutions. And so they're not in the streets. They weren't in the streets. These murders have been happening you know, for a long time. Um, and people stopped taking to the streets. Right. And that's what's new. People returned to the streets. And, and I, I think that because they weren't taking to the streets is why you hear suspicion of institutions. Mm -hmm. you know, we okay. looked up to you. Why weren't you in the streets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this is fascinating. I hear you saying in terms of the technology is new, um, the ways in which the messages are being disseminated. Also, who is the messenger? Uh, right. And, and where the messenger? sites of the generation of the messages. But what you, Dr. Jun has mentioned, the, the incisiveness of critique. Yeah, right? yeah. And so one of the things that we see in this Black Lives Movement is very significant critique, both of the kind of tactics of an older civil rights generation, but also in particular those institutions that have represented it, and the black church in particular. So the writer said last night that one of the things I think his quote was that uh, we, we he, he asked it rhetorically, yeah. but I, I'd love for you all to reflect on it. When he said, what does it mean that the black church didn't show up for us in the way... ...respect that had been so glorified with the civil rights movement of people being willing to put their bodies on the line. And my sense, and my, I might have been reading into his statement, was that that's what, the way we didn't show up, that there were not bodies next to these young folks out there facing these police, that, that there was not a willingness, in a sense, to put our bodies out in front. And um, I think uh, you, you put your finger, especially with, with the um, respectability politics, you put your finger on one of the ongoing challenges for us. Um, our work has often been tied to what Kevin Gaines calls an ideology of uplift that the whole point of what we do is in a sense to bring people into the middle class, to, to create respectability so the, the, the work, the redemptive work, quote unquote, in the community is aimed at that. And so what happens when you achieve that? When you achieve that respectability, when, when uplift has been achieved, it creates a very strange vision of what ministry has to be about, and especially the kind of optic you then have on people who, quote unquote, haven't yet made it there. And that's, I think that's part of the struggle of trying to articulate a different redemptive vision that is simply not the perpetuation of an ideology of uplift, which creates precisely the kind of isolation and estrangement from the very people that we imagine ourselves pulling up. Um, I'll say something quickly, and, then, I, and I, then I'll defer to Leslie, who's actually, as I said earlier, spent a fair amount of time sort of um, in Ferguson and on the ground. When he said that last night, I actually thought it was very poignant. I was very surprised by it um, because there was a real sense of disappointment from him, and I, and so I was taken aback by it. I didn't expect that from him. I, I, and then I thought, okay, what black church is he talking about? Who, did he, who and how did he expect folks to, to really show up? And um, when Leslie and I were on this panel two, week, two or three weeks ago in Philadelphia, two of the, the, the young Black Lives Matter folk who were from Philadelphia and New Jersey, and we were meeting in, at Mother Bethel, and they introduced themselves as being third and fourth generation AME, and they each had had to leave the church, uh, primarily around sexual and sexuality politics, but they still identified and were very excited and honored 
to be at Mother Bethel to be asked to be on the panel. Mm -hmm. And when I've been in the presence of other folks who were associated uh, with the movement, including Darnell Moore, mm -hmm. I've been really surprised, because he said this, of how many folks who are in this movement are actually either recovering seminarians, nothing personal, <laughs> right. or thinking, or, or he said, thinking about going back to seminary, uh, and people who come out of deep religious conviction from the ways they were raised, and they've had to do this or do that. And that's why I, I really feel a very religiously inflected um, movement in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then the disappointment that he expressed last night felt especially poignant, because I, I feel like that tug is still real there. It's, it's still there, and it's still really meaningful. Mm -hmm. And my final point is that, you know, in the book I wrote about churches and, and the black church, you know, I want to say which black church where and in what way. Do you mean the black churches in Ferguson? Do you mean there is no national black church? I mean, there are conventions and conferences. And this was kind of my point in that book is that if you're going to organize the black church, you got to find it first because it's because it's everywhere right, and it's right. very idiosyncratic. It's very local. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. It's it, you know, so that's the point. If you're expecting the black church to show up, you got to figure out how that breaks down into the local. And Leslie, I'll, I'll defer to you on, on this. So, so I actually want to, I'm glad that you went first because that's actually, that's. Oh, you couldn't hear it. Okay. That's oh, okay. oh, okay. Whoa, I see. <laughs> so sorry. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Okay. Uh, that's actually where I want to start um, because I, I too feel, the, I, I, I too feel this tug but as a person who lives in the black church, um, I also feel the tension that has to do with how the church gets identified. Right. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the challenge is that when, when church shows up, it's often not recognized because how people recognize the black church is through the lens of the respectability politics that they are also trying yes, yes. To, to get away from. To get away from. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'll say for folks that I know, even the churchy clergy ordained folks feel quite a bit of tension about how we show up in the space, mm -hmm. whether we show up in something that's identifiably churchy, whether we show up in vestments. So, so even when we are, even when people are there, it can be difficult to identify the folks who are there because, so there are, lot, there are lots of complex dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the black church isn't all the representations of respectability politics. That isn't all the black church is. And DeRay and others know very well that in Ferguson during the period where the tear gassing was the worst, one of the hubs where people ran after they got tear gassed was St. Mark's Church, which is a church pastored by black, a black person and peopled by black people that got raided by the police two or three different times um, as and and threatened, mm -hmm. they threatened mm -hmm. to call the L and I. Mm -hmm. They threatened. So there's the church. Yeah, yeah. Showing yeah. all the way up, right. right? Right. On the other hand, I'm, and I think it's a fair critique. I'm not saying it's an. I'm saying that this that, that there's tension in the critique itself that has to do with how is it that you would recognize the church if it showed up. And if, if the only way you recognize the church if it shows up if it's, is if it shows up looking like Martin Luther King Jr. Right, right. Then the same critique you offer, the same critique that's being deployed against you as a movement, you're actually using against the church, right? right. This is, the church is not 1955 either. The church is not 1965 either. Right, right. And I said this on the panel that Barbara and I were on with Bishop Dwayne Royster. There's nobody churchier in the world than me. <laughs> Quite honestly, there's nobody churchier in the world than Barbara. Well, we're not who folks are looking for when folks are looking for the church. And there's the 25-year-old version of us, too. And the 20-year-old right. version of us. Right. And as right. you said, Darnell is extremely churchy. 
Darnell Moore is extraordinarily churchy. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael McBride, uh, Sekou, uh, Starsky, mm -hmm. Tracy Blackman, and, and... John Selders. Bridge. I mean, and the, and the millennials themselves, right, the, the right. young folks themselves who are right. in the streets, right. are frequently very churchy. I certainly know that the Black Lives Matter folks in Philadelphia, you know, our, our interactions, um, and it, again, it's not necessarily official. There are a few folks who are members of churches, but that's not what church is entirely mm -hmm. either, right? Mm -hmm. But they're they're really churchy. They're like him quoting. They are. I, I, like the ways in which right, right, the, the right, formation right. of right, kind of right. identity and perspective on the world mm -hmm. happens is frequently in both in positive ways and not just negative ways. It is often churched. And and this goes back to the question I asked you earlier, right? What does church, who is the church? Is, is the right. church, the, is, the, is the black church the folks who voted for the President Obama in his second term even though their pastors told them not to because of gay rights and abortion? Or is it the pastor who told them not to because of gay rights and abortion? And how come they don't count as the church too? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. come the people don't count? So I'm, I'm it, 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 it would have been interesting to ask, to yeah. ask him last night, well, who, who were you? Who are you looking for? It's part of the brilliance of it, and I try to frame it this way yeah. and have the ellipsis in the middle right. of the question yeah. right. and, and to really right. highlight that in the ways that we expected, right? Because that, right. that's, that's the irony of the that's question it, it is. that you bring out. Absolutely. And it may be a part of the brilliance of the black church that, in fact, that it did show up and it was missed because it wasn't in the ways, the ways that were, were expected. Mm -hmm. so it, it's mm -hmm. part of the critique the two sides that it's that. owned and it's a part mm -hmm. of the strategy of the church that, in fact, was, was brilliant. I didn't want to cut you off, uh, Brother Christopher, if you wanted to. Be able to, uh, no, 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 no. I'm good. But you know, but what you said, uh, I think what you said also. Yeah, a white guy's going to talk about the black church now. No. <laughs> <laughs> what you said also points to one of the all ongoing challenges as we think about leadership for the future, mm -hmm. and that is to get folks to see, to look in the mirror and say, "Black church." Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the conversations I constantly have with brothers and especially with sisters in this in seminary is, "You are the church. You are the pastor." You are the future. Don't think about the church that you have been to. Think about the church that you're going to. That, that the, 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 church, the church that you will pastor are not the people who you were raised fighting and struggling with. The, perch, the churches you will lead are the churches populated by my 18-year-old daughter and younger. And Taking hold of that, I think, is really crucial. And part, of, I think, what you point out is the difficulty of being able to see the possibility of God's Spirit actually placing you in leadership. And instead of asking the question, "Where's the church?" Imagine God speaking to you, saying to you, right. "Where are the? Where is the church?" And rhetorically, as it were, you are. Right. You are. This is fascinating because I, I think it. It touches on something with Dr. Savage in your talk about uh, Obama and, and uh, the relationship with Jeremiah Wright and others. You were, you were asking this question about uh, who, who best represents black communities and their interests, right? And so we talk, we talk about leadership. Historically, uh, black ministers have played that kind of mediatorial and, and brokering role about representing the interests of, of, of black folk. What do, what do you imagine is that ongoing role? Right, as is this conversation, as other people are claiming that mantle to do the representing, particularly in the Black Lives Matters, who are either um, not ministers or not religious at all. So how do you understand this, 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 this shift in I, who's I think it, representing these interests? Right, I think it's one of the tensions, actually, uh, of the post-civil rights era, because the post-civil rights era then also creates this explosion in black elected officials. And so you could actually be in a black community and elect a black person to represent you, and it would be an elected official, and it wouldn't be Al Sharpton. So there's a, there's a debate right there about who elected Al Sharpton, or, and, and so, so you can actually have a formal elected you know, representative. And so that creates a certain tension, and not just between Sharpton, but between folks who are, who are running churches in those, in those communities. And whether you see that 
as a challenge to church authority or not, people would think of it ordinarily as a way in which you could actually elevate the, the power and authority of churches if they're able to forge some sort of good working relationship with that black elected official. And then you're in a community where you can have somebody in the planning commission and you can do, you, you can do some work um, you know, together. And so that's, so that's one side of, of, that, um, you know, of that question. But as for, um, you're asking a broader question really about where the leadership is right now and the other kind of institutional interference with the traditional power that, have been, that has been attributed to black churches is the media itself and the creation of media spokespersons as very powerful non-representative people who speak for whoever they are set up to speak for on the one hand, on the other hand. And so I think there are lots of forces that actually um, you know, work, mitigate in the contemporary period against the, the um, conceding of kind of automatic power and authority and representation to traditional black religious leadership. Mm -hmm. That's also the exciting thing about what the Black Lives Matter movement presents to us is a complex and fluid model of leadership that I actually think in some ways is actually more reflective of actually how church leadership really works. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, you know, I, I know that there's the vision of the kind of authoritarian black pastor when the truth of the matter is that most of our congregations have, um, and, and what I'd actually like to see is a, a, a more formalization of this, but it, it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fair amount of give and take and politics and brokering of authority that happens in congregational life. What I would love to see, and, and one of the things that, that I've actually said, I've said publicly that I would love to see, is, us to, is for us to take this model of um, diffuse leadership, all of which is, has to be accountable, and, and really apply it. This is a place where I think the, the uh, the uh, media has been helpful mm -hmm. um, because part of what happens if you if you're involved in um, if you're involved in social media and technology you anybody who's involved in social media and technology knows that you can't believe everything you read on the internet right, right. Um, that it, that and how you how that gets those of us who are a little older really worried about how that was going to get policed and tried in how are people going to work that out with mm -hmm. wiki and other things right and the way it gets worked out is somebody discredits it right and right. you it's very democratized i mean you hope that the discrediting goes as viral as the original lie and it doesn't often and people you know there's still these memes about how people who are dead who aren't and the recurrences of the deaths of people who died years ago and all of that kind of thing and yet but there also is the corrective that happens. And I think that's a model for leadership um, th that, that you can't just say things and that you can't just pronounce things, that there is a corrective that comes back to you and that you would do well to, to embrace and to take into the way you think, that I think is, uh, I think is exciting. So I, I don't think any of this leadership model works the way that it used to, not even the media spokesperson. Yeah who absolutely, if nothing happened in Ferguson, it's that the media spokesperson got discredited. As people watched the version of the story that was happening on CNN, and then watched the version that was happening on the live feeds on Twitter, and we're like, wait, that's not, ain't that supposed right. to be the right. same street? That doesn't look like what I'm seeing. So I think this is, this is a wonderful, I mean, it's a democratizing, D, small d, mo, move that's very exciting to me. Right. I find it fascinating, your, your response to it in terms of how we conceive of leadership, how we, uh, the dark democratization of it. Um, I, I'm remembering back um, the old political scientist uh, Adolf Reed when he, when he wrote the Jesse Jackson phenomenon, right? He was very mm -hmm. adamant about oh, yeah. religious leadership actually not showing up to the struggle because right. for right. him, they, they showed up with the presumption that they should lead because they were the men of God, right? They, they were anointed, they, they had some kind of divine mandate to lead. It would be better perhaps that they not show up if, if they were going to show up with that presumption of a certain kind of leadership. Yeah. The two of you on the end, right, have, have shown up 
in these spaces. What does that mean? How the black religious leaders who want to show up, who want to partner, who see what's happening in the streets, who see the moment, how can they show up differently, right, in ways that are uh, imagined differently in terms of different kinds of leadership? Show up and listen. You know, I, I want my pastor to listen to me. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement in Hartford, um, it's been organized or, uh, by and around uh, uh, Bishop John Selders from uh, Am Amistad AME and his wife Pamela. But it's, he's, he, they, they've been doing it in a way in which they've been listening. They've been listening to the community. They've been listening to uh, the different churches. Um, they've been going out into the, into the white community, uh, particularly to the UU uh, uh, churches. To, uh, to, to hear um, uh, what people are saying and what people's thoughts are and what people's fears are. I, I want my pastor to listen. I mean, I, I, think, I think this goes back to the thing I talked about earlier about how those of us who are trying to be conscious and um, religious types and leaders of communities, the St. Paul's Baptist Church elected me to be their leader. Mm -hmm. I don't go anywhere else with that presumption. Nobody else did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just don't think, I, it's just, to me it's really not that complicated. I am Annabelle's mama, I'm not everybody's mama. I'm St. Paul's pastor, I'm not everybody's pastor. They elected me to be the leader, to be the spiritual leader in that space and when I show up other places I show up to do what they invite me to do and if they didn't invite me and I showed up just out of some kind of other random concern which I occasionally do although not that much um, if people didn't invite me there for some particular reason then I look to find the folks who are organizing that space, and I follow them. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it actually, it, and the thing, that, the thing that's deep about that, and, and I don't know, I'm, I don't remember Adolf Reed's piece, but the, the thing that's deep about that is I can do that because I have a place where somebody elected me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I am not randomly trying to find some folks to let me be their leader. <laughs> I'm not auditioning every group to be the leader there. I have a space that I can, and so I can do other things in other spaces. I, I, I really don't actually think it's that complicated, although if you are a, if you are somebody who is looking for the space where you can be the leader, then that really is a very different posture. Right. It's a, it's, right. Right. When you don't have a space where you get right. to be the leader or you, where you're living out, I mean, and like this is a real, I mean, it's a real deal. I have been the pastor who didn't have a church, so I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a very difficult space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been the person with good ideas and I couldn't wait to experiment on some congregation. Mm -hmm. I was in seminary once. <laughs> <laughs> And how I feel going to places is really very different since I have a community of faith where I get to exercise my gifts of leadership. And it's, it becomes easier even to divest from thinking of leadership in the same way because I have a space where I can work this out and really experiment with it. And so I don't say that without some sympathy for folks who are, who are flockless or whatever that is. But but part of the thing is that when you have a frustrated call, when your call isn't being realized in the way that you want, that's all the more reason for you to be, you gotta be self-aware enough to know that just because you don't know where your people are, that doesn't make everybody your project. Um, let, me add, let me just add to that. That was my pastoral word for the day. That's my pastoral and word. And the other, the other piece of that is not just folks with a frustrated call. I do think every now and then, there are folks who have an expired call. Say that, so. <laughs> Say so. Wait, no, I'm just saying, and, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not the one to judge when the expiration date is on the package, 
But there needs to be a way, I mean, at some point, I hope to retire. Hmm. Okay, I hope to retire. I look forward to it. <laughs> there ought to be a way when people understand that it's time to retire from an expired call. Hmm. Amen. I'm going to say amen. <laughs> I'm not naming names, and I'm not talking about anybody that's in particular. A, that's a really good point. Sometimes you, you just got to let that sit right there for a minute. You know, just, that's a really you, know, you don't want to rush in and say anything else too quickly after that. You just want to say, let that marinate yeah, for I a agree, second. I agree, I um, <laughs> Time to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, retirement party. Retirement party. <laughs> Dr. Jennings, uh, in your, uh, your discussion of, of, of racialized geography, hmm. right, um, and the introduction of, of space into the conversation, right? There's hmm. been a lot of conversation here, in, even in this, about space, about what, what, what spaces certain things are, are happening in and, and where people are called to go into these spaces. But I'm, I'm, I'm very curious in your talk about what's been obscured mm -hmm. by our refusal to discuss space. Um, as, as, a, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I think how, how many times last night the question of black on black violence was raised. Yeah, yeah. Right? Boy, that was and frustrating. At least three times. And mm -hmm. he tried to address it brilliantly and eloquently each, each of those three times. Um, talking about in terms of community violence mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and comparing across communities. But one thing that might have gotten obscured is precisely what you're talking about is the geopolitics of space, mm -hmm. how space is constructed mm -hmm. and why community violence might be more prevalent in these racially uh, constructed geographies and mm -hmm. places that, that, are, that are black. I'm just, uh, if you could speak a little bit more to the significance of space in these conversations. Thank you. Well, listen, I, I thought what... Um Again, what the dear brother said last night was exactly right. And I, was, I shared his frustration the number of times he had to continue to try to suggest that it was community violence and not black on black crime. Well, clearly, um, the sequestered black space is designated as dangerous space. Um, now, we all know that the most guns in this country per capita, or should I say spatially, are not in the black community. But this is considered an incredibly dangerous space. The, the problem for us is that that narration of this being hyper dangerous space is in us. We continue to tell the story to those outside and tell the story to ourselves that when you are in a black community, you are in a very dangerous space. And Unfortunately, it's a horrible thing to see churches and church folk also narrate the black community that way, that this is a really dangerous place. Where, you know, as we all know, there are some communities that are not black that you don't want to go because they are very dangerous places. But I think this is part of the problem we have to face, try to re-narrate these spaces within our, within our communities, but also the way we narrate to ourselves as not incredibly dangerous spaces, but spaces that share in the, the problem of violence in America. I was, I was saying something to, a, to a, a group of people, one of the things that we have not gotten our mind around is the, the gun culture of America and the seductive power of the gun. And th there's a point at which I think as a fundamental part of our discipleship, we have got to take on gun culture. And the love of the gun. You see, if, if you understand gun culture, what you realize is that guns is not simply about protection. Guns are about masculinity, about power, about bonding. I had a student who told me, I was, I was talking to some students about this, and I had a student come and said to me, you know, he had, he, his father, he had two older sisters, uh, his father never talked to him when he, was, when he was a small child. One day his father walked into his bedroom, he was about maybe eight or nine. His father, he was laying in bed, his father put his feet on, a hand on the, his feet and said, get up son, let's, let's go. And, and he took him to the shooting range. And from that moment forward, he started to bond with his father. 
father and son bonding over guns. And that's what made their relationship. That was the glue of their relationship. And then the father said to him one day, son, the father had a large collection of guns. And the father said to him, someday, son, these guns will be yours. I'm going to, these guns will be yours. I'm going to pass them on to you. And that reality of gun culture and the seduction of guns, because listen, let me be clear. Guns are beautiful. They are beautiful. Beautiful. They are. They're where technology, artistry, and power all coalesce in one thing. And until we face, we face the absolute seductive power of the gun. And as churches, to say to people, stop being on the fence about this. Give up your guns. Give up your guns. Until we can start to say it's time to give up the guns, we're going to have this conversation about dangerous communities for a long, long time. Can I push back? Please. So, I don't, I don't find guns beautiful. Um, I live in one of those communities that you um, say that some folks just, you know, just shouldn't go to. I'm not getting your quote just right. But, so the local Black Lives Matter folks, um, their language tell me I'm crazy. And they won't come to my neighborhood. And I am... My students, my black students, will use the word bad neighborhood, bad community. And that's the dominant discourse that I, 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 wanna, I don't want us to internalize that. I want to reject that. My community is not a bad community. There's beautiful people in my community doing beautiful things. And there's violence in my community, but there's violence in, in every community. I don't, I don't find guns beautiful. I, I, find, I do find them seductive and hypnotic. I think guns, they have... Americans have this relationship with guns, and I think it's related both to our masculinity, but also to our hyper sense of individualism. Mm -hmm. Because guns don't build community, they destroy community. Guns give the individual the ability to, de to decimate a community. And, and it, uh, they, they, they play out um, our, our elevation of the individual above any sense of, of community, and community responsibility and community obligation. Um, check out the, the work of uh, the cultural historian Richard Slotkin. He, uh, he, he writes a lot about the interplay between violence, American culture, and, uh, and our sense of individuality. Uh, Bill Moyers had a poignant interview with him on the one-year anniversary of the massacre of, of the children in Newtown, where, uh, where he talks about that. I want to I reject the idea that there are any bad neighborhoods in America, or there are any bad neighborhoods anywhere. Um, you know, uh, are there poor neighborhoods? Sure. Are there white neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, Spanish neighborhoods? Sure. But no neighborhood is bad. Um, the people in those neighborhoods are good. I think that the, I was struck by this last night, and I said this to Barbara, who I was sitting next to. I'm struck by the need to retell the stories, which is the point that you are making. Um, because of the ways in which narratives play in our minds um, on the unconscious level and contribute to our uncon unconscious biases. I mean, mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. really fascinating work about unconscious biases and the ways in which we see things in the subconscious before we see them consciously. Yes. Such that if you flash an image of a black person with a gun and if you flash an image with a white person with a gun, you, people are able to see the gun better if the black person is holding it, even though they don't see it consciously, they're be able to identify the gun because they associate guns with black people. So there's a piece of this that's really about, I was just struck by the fact that DeRay keeps answering the same question and people keep asking it because they don't notice. Right. They don't hear. Right, right, they're not hearing it. That's not, that's not something that happens consciously, that's something that happens unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And it's something that happens because there is this narrative, black on black crime is a narrative that's playing out on a loop in our heads yes. that we're not even aware of. And it, it affects the way we turn neighborhoods that are black into bad neighborhoods irrespective of what is even happening in them. Right. Mm -hmm. Property values go down, 
same house, like built same time. Mm -hmm. We turn because of these uncon, and it's not just white people who do that. That's right. And it, it speaks to our need to, to, to learn how to tell stories differently until we, that's what's so powerful about Black Lives Matter. And you can tell how powerful it is because people are trying to change it to all lives matter. Black Lives Matter is so powerful because it actually is getting to that gut level. It's speaking to something beyond the words, speaking to that subconscious piece, and it's hitting people in a gut place. And that's why we have to keep saying it mm -hmm. until, until we actually have reshaped our consciousness around it mm -hmm. and our unconsciousness. One of the points Patricia Hill Collins makes, she expands on Marx's idea that the ideas of the ruling class are the ruling ideas. The ideas of the ruling gender are the ruling ideas. The ideas of the ruling race are the ruling ideas. It's the idea of the ruling race that black neighborhoods are bad. And I want to reject that. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, as, as each of you pointed out in some way, that dominant society is not the only one who circulates those narratives. Right. And they are especially prevalent being circulated from black pulpits all the time, yeah. right? It's part of our religious rhetoric and discourse. And, and so I'm thinking about, and when you talk about how churches, and, and here we may say black churches need to be involved in the kind of restructuring of, of the geography. Mm -hmm. What happens when the, the, the geographical vision of black folk is, is infected by those notions of black pathology and the pathology of black space, because I would argue that, that mm -hmm, many black churches are involved in that kind of uh, geographic planning and mapping, but, it's all, but oftentimes it, it, it is through the lens of a set of middle class values, mm -hmm. right, that has a disdain for black uh, poor people and so on and so forth, so what they want to change may be extremely valuable to the people in that community, but they have a middle class vision of what this geography ought to look like, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this is dangerous, this is bad, this is destructive, mm -hmm. or this is not respectable, so mm -hmm. we need to change this or that, or, you know, but it, but it, it serves their class interests. How do, we, how do we begin to reshape a more progressive vision of how, how churches interact in those spaces? Well, you putting your finger on, I think, part of the, the crucial problem. Um, a space is considered dangerous or bad as it's calibrated to the market, right? And as it's calibrated to who is able to live in that space. And what's fundamentally a problem for us as Christians is that we don't see any of this as a part of our discipleship. <laughs> and, and none of this has got anything to do with serving, serving Jesus or, or being a Christian. But what I'm saying is this is fundamental. And so you can't, you can't change the narrative if all you do is tell people change the narrative. What, what you have to do is to start to think very seriously about who has decided this is a residential neighborhood, this is a commercial neighborhood. Somebody decided that. This is a 500,000 plus neighborhood, this is a 250,000 plus neighborhood. Somebody decides that. This is where this kind of school will be. This is where this kind of school will be. And the fundamental problem for us is that our discipleship is not calibrated to the world. It's not calibrated to space. And so our rhetoric continues to float above the, the kind of intellectual work, the kind of calculations that are absolutely necessary to have a real world discipleship, right? You know, I, was, I was saying to my colleagues earlier, I mean, part of what needs to happen in seminary education, seminary formation, the kind of formation that happens through seminary, is that we, we have to teach students, oh, sorry, I was just sorry. Uh, we have to teach students to attend to space. Those of you who are moving through this whole educational process, it's crucial to learn to attend to space. You need to become spatially sensitive, spatially aware, asking, okay, What's over here? Why is this being built here? Why is this not being? Those are the questions that must come prior, come prior to people's attitudes, right? Pe you know, people's, pe what people say. It's where they live. 
and what are the possibilities and conditions of life for them where they live. These are crucial matters in order to then be actually saying something substantive about people's lives. Into the mic, I will ask, uh, let me ask one more question and then we'll open, begin to open it up in the last hour for, for questions for the audiences. I, I was watching a, a streaming, um, streaming live from the uh, Vanderbilt Cole lectures not too long ago and Nikki Finney was talking about the beautiful black sister who scaled the uh, South Carolina flagpole to take down the Confederate flag, right? And all of her brilliance and her courageousness and her audaciousness. But she also mentioned, and I thought it was a part of the beauty of her talk, was, was the white man who decided that he was going to spot her to climb the pole. Mm. And asked why he decided to spot her. He said, I just felt like white people needed to have some skin in the game. That's one. And she, she paused over that. Some, wow. some white people needed to have some skin in the game. Brother Chris, you strike me as one who has some skin in the game. And, and I wonder if you could, could talk, talk to me a little bit more about, you know, how, how, how our white allies come, come alongside in ways that are, are, disrupt these, these spatial geopolitics, these, 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 these narratives, in ways that are concrete and economic and embodied and that have some skin in the game. Bree Newsom is the name of the woman who, who took Indeed. down the flag. And when the, when the massacre happened, actually, I was brainstorming with my wife at the breakfast table, which usually means I'm talking and ranting and my wife is trying to calm me down. And I was saying, no, I think I need to go to South Carolina and take down that flag. And she says, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, thank God I didn't because she did. And it needed to be her. And thank God it was her. Um, white folks need to have skin in the game. Well, yeah. White folks need to come to my neighborhood, not to, to colonize, but to seek meaningful relationships. Yeah. Um, w w community in America is disintegrating. I, I heard um, whispers of that last night in, in DeRay's remarks, actually. Uh, this suspicion of institutions, um, this suspicion of organization, I think it's just another symptom of the way in which Americans are less and less, not that we ever had any significant community organization here, but church attendance is down. Uh, Robert Putnam's, you know, bowling alone. We, we don't engage in, in group activities. And I, I think that's to the detriment of all of us. Um, when it's, uh, it's, you know, looking out for number one. Um, we need to be involved in communities, but we need to move. We need to move away from our comfortable places of privilege. Um, not to be the one who scales the, the flagpole, but to be the one who, who spots. Mm. That, 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 that's a good image there. Thank you for, uh, for bringing that up. I want to be a spotter, I guess. Yeah. I sort of didn't mean to but you on the spot of being the only one who could address that, that question. Thanks. There's other <laughs> panelists who would like to speak to that, I'm, I'm certainly. I'll just say a couple, one thing about it. In the last night he was asked three times, both of those questions, he was asked uh, all lives matter three times. three times. He was asked black on black crime uh, three, three times. times. And one of the times he was asked black on black crime was by somebody who was black. Mm -hmm. um, and I see in those questions both a challenge to the authority of the movement to basically decide which issues are gonna work on and why. Yeah. That yeah, mm -hmm. it's not good for black people to be killing each other, um, but we're, we're working on state sanctioned violence and police brutality mm -hmm. uh, here, and, they, and that's a choice that we have made. Uh, but still be, and, and people are still calling you know, them into question for that. But in the question, all lives matter, all lives matter, um, I hear also, a, a, aside from the, the kind of white supremacist uh, version, uh, um, the white supremacist uh, understanding that is beneath that, I also hear in a more generous way, if you want to, uh, an allied plea, which is what is it that white people can do? I mean, if you're gonna be really generous about it, what is it that white people can do? 
Okay, I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> okay, he asked the ally question, so I'm trying to say that's okay. That that, um, but I hear that. I do hear that some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's not. Mm -hmm. And once you say really, and, and on the website, if you go to the Black Lives Matter website, they have a little thing that says, okay, for those of you who've been worried about, you know, all lives matter, think of it this way. What we really meant was. Black Lives Matter, comma, too. Black Lives Matter, too. Does that make you feel better? Um, mm -hmm. But I do mm -hmm. think that there's, but I do think there's a question. I think there is a legitimate question right. there. And his, answer, and his answer last night was actually, maybe another question was that, what can anybody do to help? So if you know the guy who runs the bank, if you know the guy who's right. the senator, well, nine times out of 10, you're gonna be white if you know the guy who runs the bank, you know the guy who's, so that's something that you can do. Uh, and so, I don't know, so I think those, those kind of challenge to authority uh, implicit uh, in those, both of those questions, um, that's why they're recurring. I mean, they're just, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, it's really about challenging their authority to decide what they're going to do and the way they're going to do it, which I actually support yeah. them, them. The thing about that, though, is it, it also, that question which one? The, the, this, this question about what do you do if black, I mean, I, and I, I, hear, this, I hear this in ways that, that feel like an affront. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if black mm -hmm. lives really matter, you do something about, and I hear this not just from, I hear this not just from pundits, although I cert, the pundits are certainly saying it, but mm -hmm. as I hear this from black people, um, yeah. some, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I, I recognize that in part that it's really about frustration. Uh, it's about the frustration that there's so many things that are a threat to black tr thriving. There are, and there are many things that are a threat to black thriving. Um, but I also, there is a, a kind of ten-earedness to it. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. that's, that's about both a, about the ways in which activists, people, people, all of us have the thing that's our thing, and we do our thing. And anybody, you can't, nobody can do everything. And, you know, those of us who pastor don't want to be told, well, there are other things that you should be doing. We're doing our thing. And right. those of us who teach, we're do, that's our thing. Um, that's one piece of it. But the other piece of it is also the, the lack of attentiveness and awareness to what folks who are in the Black Lives Matter movement are saying is their thing. Mm -hmm. Books and breakfast is their thing. The, the notion that uh, attending to the emotional, spiritual, and educational needs of children is not about making sure that wherever we are, we are safer to ourselves and one another is wrong-headed. It's like you don't count any of the things that are actually working on this thing that you say is important. So, it, it's not just that the Black Lives Matter movement is focused on state violence, although it certainly is focused on that. that. It's also focused on issues around housing. It's also focused on issues around education. It's also focused on issues around intercommunal violence. It's, it's also focused on sexual violence and gender-based violence. There's a lot of stuff that folks are doing towards the, to the end of that black living and black thriving get attended to. And some of it is just an unwillingness on the part of people who feel like they're judge, who are standing outside judging, an unwillingness to acknowledge what's actually being done. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's present in the, the, the All Lives Matter piece too. Um, the, such that, um, I can't remember the young, the young white man who was killed the unarmed white man who was killed by police. And it was the Black Lives Matter people who were saying, yo, that's not okay. Where would all lives matter people? Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And could I, could I just also mention that we've been talking about the, the importance of the Black Lives Matters movement, which I agree with completely. There's also the Moral Monday movement, which has yeah, been yes. a real, I have, I have seen people do, I have seen people who've never protested, never been arrested, never ever imagined themselves walking hand in hand with black folks, with folks from the LGBTQ community. 
walking hand in hand. Folks who are atheists don't believe anything, not just Christians, Jews, um, imams, rabbis. So that ally, what I want to say is that to be an ally is not only a possibility, um, it, it, it's, an, it, it's happening. And in many places, there are folk who had never imagined themselves um, doing the, this kind of work, doing it. And, you know, being learners. I think that's what's important. The, to, to be an ally is to be someone who's willing to learn. I think the funda one of the fundamental problems we face, especially when it comes to you know, doing this kind of work, is you have to have people who have the humility to say, I don't know, and I want to learn, and I want to be with you. I, those are the prerequisites. <laughs> and it, it would be great to see more Christians take that posture. You know, I think at that point we, we're looking at something that's fundamentally new. A Christian who wants to learn. 